Miranda, it's good to be with you here in um, the Gorgeous, Winchester Cathedral Garden. Yeah, isn't it? Surrounded by beautiful flowers and trees. Um, you've just produced a film from Balfour to Banksy. It's from Balfour to Banksy, Divisions and Visions in Palestine. Where did the idea of the film come from? Right, well, I don't know if you've heard of the Balfour Project. But the Balfour Project is a, is a fantastic. Do look it up on the website. They've got the most fantastic website. Balfourproject.org. Yes. Uh, yes. And, um, I mean, it started before that, really. But the actual film bit of my journey started, believe it or not, on the day of the announcement of the last general election because I was at a Balfour Project event in the House of Commons. And... Um, the MPs who were invited to the post-meeting meal couldn't go. And I was second in line, which I was rather chuffed about. And during this meal, um, I happened to mention that what they really needed was a film that was a bit more accessible than the very um, intense history film that they've got. And Actually, I then discovered very shortly after that that was an impossibility because it was going to cost 50,000 plus and that I had no experience or any clue. And I gave up on the idea. But these things sort of have a way of materialising. I've been interested in Palestine and human rights for many years because my mother was a Holocaust survivor. She would have hated that term, but she wasn't a victim. She was, but she did survive and she came from Czechoslovakia and she was always bitterly opposed to what was happening, apparently in her name, in Palestine. So I had in the back of my mind that I would spend three months in Palestine at some stage and it really was at the back of my mind and then one day when things were falling apart for me I it dropped into my intro three months Palestine um, as a um, ecumenical accompanier and what's I, that? Um, it's the ecumenical accompaniment program for Israel Palestine it's run through the World Council of Churches and they send it's international and you work for three months in one of a number of places in Palestine as an accompanier for people going through checkpoints, children going to school, etc. And I was very fortunate in being allocated Hebron. So I spent three months in Hebron in 2009 and that changed my life basically. And so after that I did my commitment of a number of certain number of presentations back here in the UK yeah and then I went backwards and forwards pretty well every year to Israel and Palestine keeping up relationships contacts and the situations um, and then I sort of on a periphery in a periphery way got involved with the Balfour project amongst many other things and just so happened to be that that particular meeting and I was known by one or two people at the meeting, so I was invited. And um, that's why. And, and it was embarrassing to turn around to them and say, this is impossible, I can't do this. But I happened, for the election, I happened to be canvassing where I live. And one of the people canvassing alongside me turned out to be an ex-BBC producer as they are, you know, the way these things happen. And uh, he actually is a lecturer uh, in journalism. And uh, he thought about, he said he'd do it as a summer project, ho ho, and that we would produce something smallish in time for the centenary of Balfour on the 2nd of November 2017. That was the theory. Um, within literally two or three weeks, I had booked, I, I had a friend of a friend who gave me £5,000, at which point I couldn't go back on it because I'd got that money. And it was really, I've got the £5,000, it's going to happen, somehow. So I managed to book a 10-day trip 
to Israel Palestine to do the shoot for three of us myself, Martin, the director, and a cameraman who was a student um, for under £5,000. We flew by Wizz Air. What's, <laughs> the, what's the film about? Yeah, sorry, I was going into the details of uh, the film. Basically, I had I gave a talk um, called Balfour, Banksley and Bethlehem because Banksy had just opened a hotel in Bethlehem that um, was a really indictment of, of Balfour and showed how uh, th what has happened since Balfour has affected Bethlehem What's it and called? the Palestinians. The hotel? It's called the Waldorf Hotel, which is a play on word because it's right by the, the huge whoops, wall um, in Bethlehem, the separation wall. And the Waldorf Hotel is a play, of course, on the Waldorf Hotel in London. And it's brilliant. It, 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 it's, you can stay in it, but it's, it's, it's a work of art and it's deeply immersive mm. into what the history of the occupation is all about. And when we shot the film in Israel and Palestine, we actually went to, we spent quite a lot of time in Bethlehem, and um, we actually ate there, and in fact, Martin and Alex, the photographer, stayed the night in the cheapest bunk beds, I didn't. And we got talking to the uh, manager of the hotel and we got permission from Banksy. Um, all the time I was there, I was in contact with Banksy's office, which is, um, and if you look carefully, there is a very odd attribution on our credits. And you can probably guess which one it is. So Banksy hasn't actually endorsed the film, but he did give us permission to do the filming we did. And within the Banksy Hotel, there is a full-size model of Balfour. And at one point in the film, this guy uh, is there and Martin asks him whether he's got any regrets and of course gets no reply. It's, it's worth seeing that. And so I had spent that year, that was 2017, I had already spent time in um, Israel-Palestine because I'd been to a conference and then I spent time in Bethlehem and did a few other things, along with seeing the um, Banksy Hotel before have suggested we should have had a, um, a settler or somebody with very strong views and actually we were advised apart from the problems because let's face it we were filming undercover uh, we went we it was rather amusing because we went as a sort of odd family um, of me and and the director as a sort of and a <coughs> student a grown-up student child yeah that sort of thing and so we knew each other's birthdays and we had these rather fancy cameras but they weren't that fancy and so we had a story, uh, which we didn't need because we were always bickering when we went through checkpoints anyway, so nobody needed to ask us. We looked apart. And um, so we did it undercover, and it would have been really difficult to have go, gone to speak to settlers or, or anything very extreme. But there is a point in it where we, inter we are invited to, a, to, I suppose, a settlement not far from Bethlehem. Uh, part of, now part of what greater Jerusalem, where we talk to an Israeli journalist, an Israeli Jewish journalist, and uh, three or four of his friends, two of whom own the flat, and 
We had a very interesting interview with them. Uh, and in fact, we have had to cut out much of what they say from the film because if we had included that, it wouldn't have been shown anywhere in this country. They were the most, their voice was the most extreme of all the voices we In terms we of prejudice? In terms of their critique of their government, which was uh, framed in a way that the latest IHRA examples would say was anti-Semitic. Mm. So what's, what was the purpose in making the film? The purpose was to have something that was more accessible and broader than the film that the Balfour Project already had, which is a 20 minute, under 20 minute, historical, very intense historical narrative uh, with um, images, you know, sort of images of, of, of historic um, historical footage. images yeah. and things. Um, which is very intense and I thought it would be nice to have something that was a little more accessible because mm. it's not very accessible. What do you hope the film will achieve? Well the idea of <coughs> what we wanted originally was that it be ready in time for the um, Balfour Centenary which was the 2nd of November 2017 um, and that it would be about half an hour long and simple. Well as it happens life doesn't work like that either and the director is a perfectionist, and he's good. And the cameraman was really good, even though he was a student. He became editor later on, and wow. And we had so much material that once they started to look at it all, they decided it needed to be a lot longer. And then we had a manifestation of it, that the first cut, I suppose, that was just after the 2nd of November, which was pretty rough. And we showed it in London. And then it was a work in progress. So it's really only now finished. And people will still say it should have this in it or it shouldn't have that. Mm. But overall, it's been received incredibly well. We're having, so the aim, you asking, you keep asking me the aim of it. The aim of it is education. I am horribly aware, as I have been ever since I've been involved, how little is understood about Britain's uh, historic involvement in the situation that is there now, and indeed Britain's complicity in the present situation. And the idea of the film was to reach out. It's a totally non-for-profit film. I had to learn an awful lot about copyright and things. Um, yeah. So we can't charge at all. Uh, we're taking it around the country and the idea is to educate. We need people to understand Britain's involvement and to understand the outcome of that involvement and what needs to happen. Mm. In what way is Britain complicit in today's times? Well, in today's, well, can I start actually going back? In the Balfour Declaration, which was 1917, the actual declaration said clearly that the um, inhabitants the, the, of Palestine shouldn't suffer. Um, in the creation of In the of creation a, of, of a, a nation, home. a home. It wasn't a nation, it wasn't a state. It was a home. And in fact, there was, it, 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 everything went wrong right from the start and the reasons for the creation, the way it developed, it would take too long for me to go into it. Come and see the film. Um, but the result is that Israel declared itself a state uh, with far more land than they were allocated by the UN originally. Um, since then they have taken over even more and are eating up what's left and Britain one of my many jobs I have a number of hats is that um, I'm a researcher in the House of Lords and I compose parliamentary questions that go um, that are then go into Hansard and the idea is so that the even though the answers are generally politely um, inane that's yeah I mean, that's really uh, yes um, they are going to Hansard and the idea is that Britain can't then deny that they know it works on the whole because it's there it's in Hansard and you get some lovely answers and actually to be fair 
Most of the answers are exactly what we'd all want them to say. The settlements are illegal, um, they're against any chance of peace. They say all the right things, except that when you pressurise the government, they never do anything. And that's how they are complicit, you think? They are complicit because they will never, ever do anything but verbally challenge. So we have examples of regret, concern, severe concern, and every version of concern that you can possibly think of. And when I go back and say, all right, you've said that this is legal, you said that this is really goes against any chance of peace, you have said that children are abused, you have said this, you have said that, so what are you going to do about it? And the answer is almost literally nothing. Mm. We, oh, we saw the ambassador again last week and expressed our the grave... The ambassador. Con- the, the Israeli ambassador. Oh, the Israeli ambassador. Uh, we expressed our grave concern. Mm. So, the British, and the British government, of course, sells and deals armaments with Israel, as it does with Saudi Arabia. And I have to say that we are just as appalled at that. Um, so, the British government is complicit because it does absolutely nothing. And in fact, it's more because of Brexit, it's more interested in doing trade with countries like Israel and Saudi Arabia and others that are questionable than even considering the human rights of those people affected by those countries. So how is the film um, available? If people are watching this interview, how can they access the film? If you go on the website, of uh, um, which is www balfortobanksy.com be completely freely available once we feel it's had proper you know been aired enough and the website again is www.belfortobanksy.com Miranda thank you very much thank you was that all right <laughs>